We are live. Welcome back. We are not doing chapter eight. I am not good enough at gases to teach it. And if I'm not good enough to, enough to teach it, I will not teach it because it is a waste of your time. We are moving on to solutions, right? And the solutions chapter is relatively short. And if we get through it in quickly enough, right, we can move on to one of my favorite chapters, acids and bases, right? Let's get started on solutions. So solutions are just mixtures, right? They're just mixtures of things. And the majority of solutions you're going to see is some solid dissolved in liquid. Like you dissolving your sugar in water, or dissolving a salt in water, or dissolving oxygen in blood, right? Let's hope you're not doing the last one at home by yourself. So when a solution forms, right, let's say specifically of water, let's say that you have a tub of water, and inside the water you have sodium chloride. And the sodium and chloride ions disperse inside the water, correct? OK. If you were to zoom in on one of those, let's zoom in on the chloride, right? What's going to happen? when the solvent interacts with the solute. Yeah, so it's going to surround the chloride with itself. But we know that water has partial charges around it because of a dipole moment that exists between the inside the molecule, but dipole, sorry, dipole moment that exists between the hydrogen and the oxygen, right? So since this is partial positive and this is partial negative, we are going to surround the chloride with the partial positive hydrogens. And it's going to kind of form something like this. Partial positives everywhere. And surround that. That is called dissolution. So dissolving something inside of a solution. And this means that what? The very classic concept of likes dissolve likes. Why can't you mix oil and water? Because the oil is super nonpolar, and the water is super polar, and they just, they just don't interact. It just doesn't work. But you could take octane and dissolve it in hexane, and swirl them together, you won't be able to tell the difference, right? Because they're both very nonpolar, right? This calls back to a specific concept that I talked about in biology. So your blood is a majority what? Water, right? And in the blood, sometimes we have hormones. Does anyone remember the classes of hormones we had? Classes of hormones. If you guys have been doing your Anki, they should have come up. There are steroid hormones. Peptide hormones and amino acid derivative hormones. Very good, right? Polar, polar, nonpolar. Why? Because it's based in cholesterol, which looks like this. Very nonpolar. Very, very nonpolar, in fact. So when we synthesize steroid hormones, and we secrete them into the blood, are they allowed to just float around however they want? No. You have to carry them on something, right? And what is that protein I said that you normally get carried on, or some of them get carried on? Albumin. Albumin. And here's the next step forward. If albumin is made of amino acids, right, and we know that those amino acid side chains can either be polar or nonpolar, the part of albumin that binds steroid hormones probably has amino acids that have side chains that are nonpolar to better bind the steroid. Does that make sense? Very good. It's all about, it's not the same thing as a solution, but it's similar. It's similar. I actually don't know. 
I'm not 100% sure. That would be interesting to like ask though. So his question was, if steroid hormones bind to um, proteins, and normally proteins put their hydrophobic or nonpolar regions on the inside of the protein, does the steroid hormone need to bind on the inside of a protein? What I'm assuming is that the protein kind of forms like a little capsule and it like kind of sneaks its way in there. I'm not 100% sure though. But remember that the protein is probably much larger than the hormone. So it's able to twist and bend and blah, blah, blah. Right. Okay. Now, um, you also need to know solubility rules, unfortunately. I never took the time to like memorize all of them, but I realized that by doing enough questions and like just hammering them away, I could kind of just get away with it. Right? So let's go over some solubility rules. All salts of alkali metals, NH4 plus, nitrates, and acetates are soluble in water. All halides, except fluorides, or with these metals, lead, silver, and that dimercuric thing right there. Yeah. So all, halides. all halides? So what are halides? Uh, uh, like Group 17. Okay. What are the halides? F, C, L, B, R, I. You probably won't go lower than that. Also, credit where credit is due. These are not my notes that I'm using because I don't have notes for this chapter. I didn't write them down. Um, this is from someone on Reddit. I will get you their name and I'll post them in the description of this video so you guys can also look at their notes. And sulfates are soluble. Except calcium and the calcium group and lead. So these are soluble bits. What's insoluble? Metal oxides. So like lead oxide, magnesium oxide. Except for alkali metals, of course, because all salts of alkali metals are soluble. Hydroxides. Except alkali. NH4 plus, calcium and its group. Carbonates, sulfates, oops, not sulfates, my bad, phosphates, sulfites. and sulfides, except alkali and NH4. Did I know all of these? Fuck no. Hell no. 
I I tried so hard. Not not just tried so hard for the MCAT. I tried so hard since fucking ninth grade to try to remember. It didn't. It did not happen. Still don't know them. That's why I had to keep looking at this goddamn laptop. Still don't know them. So can you get a 521 without knowing your solubility rules? Yeah, I'm living proof, right? But if you know them, hell, you'll do better than me. <laughs> All right. All right. I feel like we already talked about like percent composition and things like that. Those same rules kind of apply to solutions, right? So let's talk about solution equilibria. Determined by KSP, the equilibrium constant of solubility or solutions. That's a solid, and now it's aqueous. And similar to the law of mass action of Ka, we have something like that. You guys get that, right? Yeah? So the lower the KSP, the less of it will dissolve. And sometimes when very, things have very, very low KSP, we call those insoluble, right? It's just that instead of Q here, in, instead of Q and K, it's called the ion product. So if IP is greater than K, then more of it dissolves. If IP is less than K, or sorry, more of it will go back. If IP is less than K, more of it will dissolve, et cetera, et cetera. But we talked recently in acid base about the common ion effect, right? So let's say that you have a metal or a salt that dissolves very little, right? Let's say you have copper sulfate or copper sulfide. And you put it in a solution of water, and you get aqueous copper and aqueous sulfide. And inside of this, when it's at equilibrium, you added copper to nitrate. Because nitrates are what? Soluble, right? Well, if you add this, the copper to nitrate is going to dissolve into copper and nitrate. The nitrate's a spectator here. What's the copper going to do? And by the rules of Le Chatelier's principle, the equilibrium of this will shift to the left, thus decreasing the free sulfide ion. Yes? something I have to talk about called the Van't Hoff factor. And normally you'll see it inside of this equation, which calculates the osmotic pressure of a specific solution. Where have we seen osmotic pressure before? This is, this is like the part where you guys are really going to start to hate me because I'm going to bring up old topics and expect you to remember them. If you have a capillary 
And that capillary is surrounded by the interstitium, which remembers the black hole that surrounds all cells, right? You have a force going out of the capillary and a force going into the capillary, and a force going into the capillary and a force going out of the capillary, or out of the interstitium and into the interstitium. This force that pushes fluid out of the capillary is the hydrostatic pressure of the capillary. And the thing that sucks water into the capillary is the oncotic pressure of the capillary. This force that pushes fluid out of the interstitium is the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitium. And this force that pulls fluid out of the, uh, into the interstitium sucks water into the interstitium is the oncotic pressure of the interstitium. The oncotic pressure is determinant upon the molarity of solutes inside of, that, inside of that space. So if you have a lot of solutes here, you can imagine that the capillary is going to pull water out of the interstitium to decrease the molarity of those solutes. Does that make sense? Why would that decrease the molarity? Because it's a certain number of moles over liters. And if you increase the liters, you decrease the molarity. So this is a compensatory mechanism to fight increased plasma osmolarity, to draw out fluid from the interstitium. So this is that oncotic pressure that we've been talking about from back in biology. What is the I? It's the number of free solutes you get from a substance. The I of glucose is 1. The I of sodium chloride is 2. Why? Because in a solution, sodium chloride will turn into sodium and chloride. So the I of magnesium hydroxide, oops, hold on, yeah, is 3. Right? The I of sodium phosphate is four. Why? Because the phosphate's a polyatomic ion. One, two, three, four. Also, solubility rules do come up quite a bit in human physiology. If you have a kidney disease, and that kidney disease increases your free calcium, it's possible that that calcium in your kidney binds up this ion called oxalate. And when that when those two things combine, because of the, in so what happens is you have calcium oxalate. I'm just going to write ox, right? And there's an equilibrium, and you have calcium and oxalate, right? And when those two things dissolve, but you increase the free calcium, what's going to happen? You push towards calcium oxalate. Calcium oxalate is a solid. That is called a kidney stone. That's how kidney stones can form. One way they can form. OK? Other than that, I mean, I know the, solu the, the solutions chapter is very high yield. That's all I got to say. Good luck. <laughs>